So I'm going to finish this section going through two different variables or two different examples and they're sort of difficult examples but I think they're important. So the first is to look at an interchange of variable technique where I have um, in this case my y values are between functions and my x values are constants so this is a type 1 region and we're going to change it into a type 2 region to be able to integrate. The motivation here is the fact that if I try to integrate this if I start just by integrating with respect to y, notice that the sine of y squared is something that we don't have a closed form for being able to integrate. We would have to go to a Taylor polynomial and then integrate terms of the Taylor polynomial if you took calc 3. You don't want to do that. So instead, we're going to integrate with respect to x first. Um, but to do that, we're going to have to start by interchanging the order of integration. And I need to start by drawing the picture of the region of integration. So we're looking at our x's in this case are going from 0 to 1, and our y values are going from the line y equals x to the line y equals 1. So let's draw a picture of that. Here's the line y equals x, and here's the line, if this is where y equals 1, we have the line y equals 1. So we know that we're going the lower bound is the, the diagonal line, the upper bound is the constant line y equals 1, and our x values are going from 0 up to this intersection point, which is 1. So we're talking about this triangular region. That's what these bounds tell us. Now we need to change this to be a type 2 region. I'll move this up so we still have the picture. And all I need is the picture to be able to make this into a type 2 region, right? So instead of having these vertical line segments, I'm going to think of having horizontal line segments. And that means that our x values are going to go from this straight line where x equals 0 on the left out until this function. And in this case, the function y equals x. When I solve it for x, it just becomes x equals y. And our y values are going to go from down here at y equals 0 to up here at y equals 1. And now that I've changed it into a type 2 region, I can perform the original integration. So let's set up this integral. We want the constant bounds on the outside, so y is going to go from 0 to 1. We'll have the variable bounds on the inside, where x equals 0 to y. And recall our function was the sine of y squared and we're integrating first with respect to x and then with respect to y. So when I integrate this with respect to x, this whole chunk, sine of y squared, is just a constant because we think of y as a constant. And that means that our integral of the inside is going to be the sine of y squared times x, evaluated from x equals 0 up to y. And don't forget we have this outer integral on the outside y equals 0 to 1. So now when I evaluate my bounds, I plug in y for x, and I get the sine of y squared times y minus the sine of y squared times 0, which is just 0. And now I do my next step of integration, where I integrate with respect to y, and look! We have this y sitting here, and this is really helpful because now we can actually do um, a technique of integration. We're going to do a u substitution. So recall from previous calc courses that in this case, I'm going to let my, maybe I'll rewrite this integral. We're going to integrate y equals 0 to 1 of the sine of y squared times y dy. And what is the messy thing that's on the interior of my parentheses? In this case, I'm going to let u equal y squared. And then we know that du is going to be equal to 2y dy. And this is nice because I have a dy term here, I have a y term here, and I need a 2 term. Well, so I'm going to multiply this by 2 and by 1 half. And that'll give me the 2 term to be able to do this u substitution. So I multiply this by 2. I also multiply it by 1 half because I haven't changed the integral at all. I can multiply things by 1 and that's fine. Now this whole chunk, 2y dy, becomes my du. 
And so now I'm looking at the integral of 1 half sine of u du. I'm leaving, I'm not going to convert my bounds. You can if you want. Instead, I'm going to convert back after I integrate. When I integrate sine of u, sine, the integral is negative cosine. So I get negative 1 half cosine of u. And I want to evaluate it from where y equals 0 to 1. So I need to change this u back into a y. And I get negative 1 half cosine what was u equal to? u is equal to y squared, evaluated from where y equals 0 to 1. When I plug these numbers in, I get negative 1 half cosine of 1 squared, which is 1, minus negative 1 half cosine of 0 squared, which is still 0. The cosine of 0 is 1, so my final answer is negative one half cosine of one, which isn't nice to simplify because one isn't really a radian value, plus the cosine of zero, which is one times one half, which is one half. So we were able to integrate because we interchanged the bounds of integration. My final example is a three dimensional example. Suppose we were asked to find the volume of the solid between the planes x plus y plus z equals 2 and the plane x plus y plus 2z equals 2. So first, I'm going to get an idea of what these planes look like by evaluating where they intersect the x, y, and z axis. So just like when you graph lines, you want to find the intercept of the line to be able to find out what the line looks like. We're going to find the x, y, and z intercepts of this plane. My first plane, maybe I'll label this P1 because it's my first plane. Notice if y and z are both 0, my x value is 2 because I just plug in 0 for x and y and I find out that my x value is out here at 2. Similarly, all of my intercepts in this case are at 2. And this Maybe it's not that helpful visually, but to me, it gives me an idea of what this plane is doing. When it cuts each of these axes, it's cutting them in this triangular region and it extends outwards, obviously, and infinitely in every direction. But this gives me an idea of how it intersects the z, y, and x plane. And then next, I can do the same thing for this uh, plane. I'll call it P2. When y and z are 0, x is also 2, and y is 2. But in this case, when x and y are 0, z would be equal to 1 to make this equation correct. So that means that this plane is this lower plane down here, and it extends infinitely in every direction. Um, we need more information. This should be the volume of the solid between the planes. These are the two planes um, in the first octant. There. Otherwise it would be an infinite amount of area between these two planes. But now we've reduced it to just being the space that's sort of trapped in between these two pieces. Right? That there's one on top and there's one on bottom and it extends out this way. It's sort of like a, a, a smushed tetrahedron piece that we're looking for. In order to solve this, we're going to have to find out what is our base of integration and what is the height of the function. In this case, we have two different heights for the function. We have this upper height and then we have the slightly lower height. But the base is the same in both cases, and the base is this triangle. So let's look at the base. And we're going to call it, it's the region in the xy plane, and it's the region where my intersection is up here at y equals 2 and also where x equals 2 and it's going to be this whole base. Maybe I can, um, this is the bottom of this tetrahedron style region and it really is just this triangle right here. So let's come up with bounds. I, my instinct is to always go with a type 1 region just because I think that it's easier to think of functions y equal to some function of x. 
So in this case, our y values are going from where y equals 0 on bottom here until y hits this line. And I need to come up with an equation of this line. This is the line y equals, it has a slope of negative 1, just by doing rise over 1, and an intercept of 2. So the bounds on my y value go from negative x, from 0 to negative x plus 2. The bounds on my x values are easy. They, these go from 0 to 2. Those are the bounds on my base. And now we need to find out what's going on with our height. Really, we want this upper plane to be the upper height and the lower plane to be the lower height. But our planes right now are written in terms of this. So we're going to need to rewrite our, our, the function to be able to have z as a function of x and y. So rewriting p1, I see that it could be equal, z is equal to 2 minus x minus y. And plane 2, z is equal to um, 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 half y. And now we have all the, woo, sorry, that was all crooked. Now we have all the pieces that we need to be able to set up our integration. We found our bounds of integration. Our x values are going from 0 to 2. Our y values are going from, let me peek, 0 to negative x plus 2. And what function are we integrating? I'm thinking of this as the difference of two functions. We want to find the space in between. So the space in between in this case will have to be the upper plane, which is p1, minus the lower plane. And that's the function that we're looking over. So the upper plane is given by 2 minus x minus y. And the lower plane is given by 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 half y. And we're integrating all of this with respect to y first and then with respect to x. Alternately, you could compute each of the integrals separately and then take the difference of the two volumes. It's essentially finding the volume of the big tetrahedron and then subtracting out the volume of the little tetrahedron. And now it's just arithmetic, and we can go forward integrating. If you don't really want to watch arithmetic, you can pause or end the video now. Otherwise, I'm going to finish off this example. 2 minus 1 is 1. Negative x minus a negative one-half x. I'm adding a half of an x to a negative x, so I end up with minus one-half x. Negative y plus one-half y ends up being negative one-half y. We're integrating as y goes from zero to negative x plus two, and we have our x is going from zero to two on the outside, dy dx. Now that I've simplified, I'm going to integrate with respect to y. 1 becomes y, negative 1 half x, I treat as a constant, and then negative 1 half y, I'm going to square y, and that makes it minus 1 fourth y squared. And I'm going to evaluate that from y equals 0 to negative x plus 2. Don't forget that we have our outer x integral that we'll have to get to next. So I'm going to plug in negative x plus 2. I'm going to write that as 2 minus x because I think it's faster to write. So that becomes 2 minus x minus 1 half x times 2 minus x minus 1 fourth times 2 minus x squared. I'm going to do some arithmetic to simplify this. This is 2 minus x minus 1 half times 2 becomes x, and then this becomes plus 1 half x squared. Here, I'm going to do a little scratch work because I don't want to square this in my head. This is going to be 4 minus 2x minus 2x becomes minus 4x plus x squared, and I'm multiplying all of that by 1 fourth, so that ends up being minus 1 plus x minus 1 fourth x squared dx.
I'll do one more step of simplification where I take all of my constants and put them together and I get 1. I take minus x minus x plus x and I'm left with a minus x and I have a half x squared minus a fourth x squared and that becomes minus a fourth x squared and this is boring old integration I'm integrating with respect to x, my 1 becomes an x, my x becomes a 1 half x squared, and my x squared becomes minus 1 twelfth x cubed, and I evaluate that from x equals, oh no, you didn't see any of this. There we go, I evaluate it from x equals 0 to 2, so when I plug 2 into here, I get 2 minus 2 squared is 4 divided by 2 is 2 2 cubed is 8 8 twelfths minus plugging 0 in I get all zeros 2 minus 2 is 0 so my final answer is negative 8 twelfths which is 4 no I'll divide both top and bottom by 4 and I get 2 thirds negative 2 thirds and if you watch this video and you catch an algebra error, I would love for you to write that in the comments of the video because it's very possible when doing this algebra live that you can make mistakes with minus signs. Thanks so much. That's all I have for this section.